Hello, my name is Brittany Klinke, and I am the Director of Admissions at Wheaton Academy, and we're so excited that your family is considering our school for your student, and we're excited that you're here watching us. We know this year it's important to introduce our school to you in a variety of ways, whether that's in person or online. And so we've made this three-part video series to introduce you to some of the people here at Wheaton Academy and explore different topics and ultimately hear different voices of what makes this school so fantastic and so great and hopefully a place that you see your student coming next year. In this video series, we're going to focus on a couple different topics each time. And today we're focusing on academics. First, I'd like to introduce you to our principal, Corey Hockett, who's going to spend some time highlighting the key distinctive qualities of a Wheaton Academy education. Hello, my name is Corey Hockett and I have the privilege of serving as the principal here at Wheaton Academy. And as you think about school, one of the hallmarks of school is academics. Academics at Wheaton Academy is student-centered. Our faculty and staff look to get your students hands-on engaging with problems and ideas as they take ownership for their learning. It's rigorous. At Wheaton Academy, our students are challenged. They're challenged in multiple ways, not only with the curriculum and the classes, but also the opportunities they have. And just so you don't think that challenge just means hard classes, challenge means that we approach each individual student. We look at where they are and we seek to find ways to help them grow and become who God's created them to be. One thing we're really excited as we talk about the rigorous curriculum and academic opportunities that we offer. Last year, in an unprecedented year, over 200 of our students took AP tests sponsored by the College Board and 92% of them scored a three or better, giving them the opportunity to earn college credit. We are excited not only for the academic experience your student has while they're at Wheaton Academy, but for the ways it prepares them for what they will do in the future. Thank you, Corey. I appreciate how you highlighted that a Wheaton Academy education is student-centered, rigorous, and focused on each individual learner. And so to unpack a little bit more about our academics and our curriculum, I interviewed our vice principal, Brad Thornton, to talk about a number of different topics. What's at the core of our curriculum, our teachers, different programs that we offer, how we individualize student schedules, and ultimately how your students can explore their passions in their classes while they're students here at Wheaton Academy. So I hope you enjoy my conversation with Brad Thornton. Hello everyone, I am here with Brad Thornton, who is one of our vice principals at Wheaton Academy. He's been here about eight years, and I had the privilege of teaching with him in the English department um, several years ago. He also was our varsity football coach and has fully transitioned into an administrative role this year as vice principal. So I'm very excited for you to meet him. Brad, welcome uh, to today. And really our goal is to talk about curriculum at Wheaton Academy. Um, a lot of families have questions about classes and various things. So I'd love for you to start and help us understand what's at the core of a Wheaton Academy curriculum and therefore learning experience. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Brittany. Mm -hmm. At the heart of our curriculum is people. And in the classroom, you have teachers and students. And I want to first spotlight the teacher. Uh, we hire living curriculum teachers, mm -hmm. which means we are really caring, passionate about these teachers having first an anchored and solid relationship with Jesus Christ. We have Christ following leaders in the classroom. Mm -hmm. And as these leaders uh, understand themselves better, they, they know that God has gifted them with specific passions, specific gifts in their areas of discipline. Mm -hmm. So for someone in our math department, for instance, God has gifted them with a very specific passion for mathematics, the study of order and the created order. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and not only has he gifted them with a passion for their subject, he's also gifted them with a passion for other people, for mm -hmm. students, caring for raising the next generation of students as thinkers, as learners, and as followers of Jesus as well. Mm -hmm. And when the living curriculum teacher is in action, it's really a beautiful thing, seamlessly and organically blending their passion for their subject with their ability and love for Jesus Christ and their care for students and student growth and student empowerment. And it's so much fun to step into the classroom and see this in action, to see student-centered learning environments led by people who care deeply about their subject of study and are able to share that passion with their students in a way that's really attractive and inspirational. 
Awesome. I would say that to me is one of my favorite things about working here. <laughs> it's just having an army of people who I know love the Lord, love what they do, and love students. Um, and I think for me, when I think about the core of the curriculum, that is such a differentiator for us. Um, because yes, at other schools, you may have a Christian teacher, may not, but here, 100% of our faculty and staff um, are missioned to be um, kind of disciplers of their students through whatever platform it is, whether it's teaching or coaching or whatever. So um, I'm glad to hear you think that's the core too. <laughs> um, with that though, I feel like we've got to talk about the benefit of having um, kind of a, a group of living curriculum teachers and how they incorporate biblical worldview in their teaching. So can you talk a little bit about the worldview training that students would receive as a part of being a student here? Yeah, typically students, when they enter in here as freshmen, think that they're only going to receive biblical training in their Bible classes. <laughs> sure. However, our teachers know that part of their task, part of their duty in teaching well here is to equip students to think biblically about the world all around, no matter what the discipline. Even math, English, a fine arts class, all, all of these classes offer the opportunity to interact with their discipline in a way that they get to grow as learners grow as uh, followers grow in empathy. Um, I'm thinking specifically in, in my English class, one of the things we used to do uh, is ask, whenever we'd read a story, even if it was a story by someone who was not a follower of Jesus, not someone who believed in God, there's still truth in that story that we can latch onto and grow from and understand mm -hmm. and ask the question, where is their truth? Where is their beauty? Where is their goodness in this mm -hmm. story? regardless of the worldview of the person who's writing it. Mm -hmm. And we do evaluate those worldviews. We'll ask, what source is this coming from? Mm -hmm. How might it agree with what a Christian believes? How might it disagree? Mm -hmm. And even in the disagreement, how, how can we grow more empathetic and understanding of other perspectives and views that are out there mm -hmm. so that we can learn and grow as well? And that goes for all classes. That's just one example of an English class. But sure. yeah, as I mentioned, with the living curriculum teachers passionate about their area of discipline, they know how to, because of their love for Christ, because of their love for students, kind of seamlessly integrate those questions into whatever course of study they're, they're teaching. That's great. Yeah. I love that too. And I was a teacher here it, it was it felt organic in a way that was really genuine you know we didn't just like slap a verse at the bottom of the quiz and say like this is now a christian quiz but truly it was something that they could understand that there's depth and understanding in their faith and whatever they're doing and really exposing um really how it, it's naturally there uh, for students. Now that we've talked a little bit about the core of the curriculum, which for us is really our teachers and the relationship they will have with students as a result, uh, let's talk about the curriculum itself. So what are some of the kind of favorite programs you have or some um, exciting features that are a part of our learning experience? Yeah, sure, I'd love to spotlight a few programs. Recently, we have really put a focus on our master program, mm -hmm. which stands for Mathematics, Applied Sciences, Technology, Engineering, and Research. Mm -hmm. And that coincided with the opening of our new Science and Technology Center, mm -hmm. featuring six labbed classrooms, mm -hmm. a whole maker space, and some other smaller breakout research rooms. This program is phenomenal for students who are interested in going into studies of anything within those fields and offers uh, many different electives uh, that students could take, engineering, uh, robotics, uh, our math classes apply to that as well. And real hands-on opportunities within the science classes themselves that all students take. Uh, so students, if they're really passionate about that field of study, can enter into this master program track, so to speak, to try to take as many classes within those disciplines as possible and actually graduate with a master scholar designation on their diploma. Mm -hmm. That's really attractive for schools that are more engineering or research focused or based. It's awesome. And I love that every student is really a part of the master program, mm -hmm. just like how at other schools they might be a part of a STEM program. You know, for us, even that acronym is an example of kind of fusing our biblical worldview with our curriculum. Uh, but you're right, there's so many different opportunities for students to get plugged into really specialized classes that sometimes aren't really afforded to until the college level. But for us, an incoming freshman could take engineering if they wanted to. So yeah. great, cool. What are there some other favorite programs? Another program I'd love to highlight would be the fine arts program, mm -hmm. uh, which is robust. And I, I would even use the word ridiculous to describe <laughs> it because it is 
totally <laughs> unusual to see a school of our size that has such robust offerings in the fine arts programming. Mm -hmm. Uh, from visual arts to media arts to performing arts, our, our students are engaged with um, some really exciting things in the world of arts. Uh, I walk away from concerts overwhelmed by the talent level of our students and what our teachers are able to pull out of them. Mm -hmm. uh, our musical production in the spring is one of the spotlights every year. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have some really talented visual artists too that have the opportunity to exercise those skills in tiered classes, mm -hmm. starting with, for instance, a basic illustration class, working its way up to an advanced illustration class, to a AP studio art class. Mm -hmm. uh, students have through a variety of elective options, the opportunity to explore passions and gifts in the area of fine arts. Mm -hmm. Great. And really with both master and fine arts, I love that we have class opportunities that can happen in the eight to three, but then there's also tons of things after school, which we'll talk about at a different time. <laughs> uh, great, so the master program, fine arts, anything else kind of rise up as favorites? Very recently, we have put into our curriculum guide the opportunity to earn a global studies certificate. Yes, yes. We have such an international presence here at school from the 60 international students that we welcome onto campus each year that we want to place more of an emphasis on the global nature of our community mm -hmm. and the fact that the gospel reaches to all ends of the earth. Mm -hmm. And so to incentivize students to engage further with some of the opportunities they have in front of them in the building here through classes, mm -hmm. but also uh, through co-curriculars and other opportunities like Winter M. I want to spotlight that in just oh, a yes, second. Oh yes, please do. Um, yeah, we've offered the opportunity for students to earn that designation on their diploma as well, mm -hmm. uh, to uh, take their position as global citizens in this world mm -hmm. and to utilize class opportunities and service opportunities and also just connection with our international program to earn that designation. That's great. Yes. Now, tell us about Winterum. It's yeah. one of my personal favorites, <laughs> so you got to bring it up. Yeah, Winterum is a unique two-week opportunity in January uh, where students have the opportunity to take classes, engage in an internship, or take a trip. For those who are on campus taking classes, these are unique classes, oftentimes hands-on or, or different from what you would normally see during a, a school day or a semester. Uh, for instance, um, one of the classes that's become popular recently is a woodworking class. Yeah. So students are actually in the shop uh, crafting things out of, out of wood. Um, Internships are great opportunities for students to actually get some real life workspace opportunities and, uh, and experience. Um, normally students connect with uh, just their networks in order to be placed in an internship and oftentimes students are pursuing internships in areas that they might want to study in college or even as a career. And I'm thinking of one student in particular a couple of years ago who wanted to be an engineer. So he did an uh, internship at Camcraft and actually discovered through the internship that the type of engineering that Camcraft is engaged in mm -hmm. is not the type of engineering he wanted to go into. Sure. So the experience from that internship actually informed mm -hmm. his college study, and he's going to graduate soon and go into a field, uh, into an engineering career mm -hmm. that uh, that was deeply impacted by his internship experience. And then finally, we have our trips. Mm -hmm. uh, we typically offer anywhere from 10 to 15 trips, some domestic, some international, some service-oriented, some more educational, some adventure trips. Uh, that go all across the globe. And in a typical year, we have anywhere from 175 to 200 students who are traveling mm -hmm. and uh, just gleaning uh, travel experience that is oftentimes impactful and sometimes life-changing and transformational. One of the things that I love about Winterum is I think it's a real playground for students to explore what they could do with their future. And it's just two weeks, you know, because sometimes it's like, like you said with the internship, Sometimes students come back like, I did not want to do that. I'm like, I am so glad you figured that out in those two weeks rather than your junior year of college and have to do a huge career pivot of a major or whatever. And so I, I think Wyndham provides a really cool opportunity for tangible, different, hands-on experience for students to just explore their future and explore whatever passions that might be kind of um, coming in other classes and real time to focus on it. In fact, I think there's actually a video about Winter Realms. I'd love to take a break and show our viewers a little spotlight of past Winter Realm experiences. provides opportunities outside the classroom to experience new things, a breath of fresh air.
This mission trip has just meant the world to me. To just take part in that experience and to see it firsthand instead of hearing about it from other people. Most students hadn't worn tap shoes before they had entered into the classroom, let alone tap dance. So to put forth a performance, to put forth choreography, and then to have them practice it and do it and become confident in it is just incredibly gratifying. Everyone at Wheaton Academy is excited because of Wintrum. So now that we've heard a little bit about programs, um, I want to talk some specifics about an actual student's experience in our curriculum. Um, and so I know that's a lot of questions families ask us, so what would my schedule look like? And you know, is there like a track where this is what freshmen do, this is what sophomores do, et cetera. So can you kind of talk a little bit about kind of how students get schedules, how flexible they are, how inflexible? Talk a little about that for me. Yeah, sure. So we do have a core set of graduation requirements that students need need to engage with. So there are some classes that are already chosen for students. Mm -hmm. However, within that structure, there's a lot of flexibility and also space for students to take classes that really interest them. Mm -hmm. And last year, we had the opportunity to engage in a little bit of a project mm -hmm. that you and I worked closely yes, on, yes. <laughs> uh, where we went through and we identified just some different student areas of interest and the ways that our curriculum can flex to meet those areas of student interest. Mm -hmm. So we put together a bunch of different sample student schedules, yes. everything from the generalist, a student who is interested in taking just <laughs> all sorts everything. of different classes, a <laughs> little bit of everything, mm -hmm. uh, to the futurist, a student who's thinking about trying to scoop up as much college credit as possible. So that schedule is chock full of all the different AP classes, 24 different AP classes <laughs> that we offer here at Wheaton Academy. Yeah, that and, student was very ambitious in oh, their ambi schedule. Yeah, maybe not realistic for the futurist, <laughs> but still. But it can be done. It can be done. <laughs> And even the, the uh, master student or the student who's interested in going into the field of science, just mm -hmm. to demonstrate how many different classes are able to meet those needs and what a master track designation might look like mm -hmm. working through four years here, starting with freshman year. So we put those together just to demonstrate that whatever areas of passion students have, mm -hmm. they can have those needs met with the myriad of different, not only core classes that we offer here, but also elective options that are available as well. Mm -hmm. I also love um, when we talk about really individualizing student schedules, we have some classes that kind of double dip, they're, they're cross-curricular, if you will, where they're um, really not compartmentalizing departmental learning that I think sometimes is so um, standard in education, but really printing a hybrid learning experience for students to see how their passions might not in their heads intersect, but very much do. So can you talk a little about those cross-curricular classes? Yeah, I'm really excited about those classes. We started offering those a few years ago mm -hmm. uh, and really placing an emphasis on the fact that in today's workplace, 21st century mm -hmm. technological <laughs> skills at our fingertips, mm -hmm. There just aren't too many spaces where only one skill or one discipline is the focus. Mm -hmm. 
uh, but rather students need to become really skilled at integrating skills from multiple disciplines. And so that was the genesis or the idea behind the classes. And now we have a whole slate of classes available for students to take that, yes, from a logistics standpoint, check the boxes for graduation requirements, uh, but more importantly are pushing for more of these advanced cross-curricular skills. So for instance, the student that is passionate about story and the power of story mm -hmm. and also wants to ask the question of how to bring that story to life mm -hmm. through uh, computer programming, 3D printing, design, mm -hmm. some of those elements that we see in like a, a Pixar movie, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a class called Story and Animation Design that hits on the skills of story building, but also bringing that story to life through some of the technical and design elements of the story. Uh, one of our master classes is AP Seminar, mm -hmm. uh, which hunkers down on uh, argumentative skills and how to present a really good argument through writing, but also needs to be evidence-based and research-based. So mm -hmm. combining skills from multiple classes there. We have an expository preaching class, <laughs> uh, which is a Bible-English crossover. So mm -hmm. combining the skills of an English class, communication, mm -hmm. really speaking clearly and well, combined with the expositional nature of diving into scripture, pulling out key points, and delivering a firm and solid message. Those are just some examples, but yeah, those classes are really exciting. Yeah, those are so good, and I know they'll grow. I know in future years there'll be more and more classes to talk about. But let's take a step back for a second and talk about um, the pillars of a student schedule. Um, kind of what is, what's the makeup, which I know some of the sample schedules will show. Um, but let's talk about kind of how students get into their classes and what makes up their schedule. Um, I know every student will take English classes, will take Bible classes for their four years, math, science, social studies, some other little kind of semester requirements of a health class or um, a communications class or something. You know, how, how do we get students in those classes? Maybe how flexible are kind of those classes? Is, is that something we just lock in? Talk to me a little bit about um, how students build their schedules. One of our guiding learning philosophies is this concept known as the learning zone, where we try to place students intentionally in classes where they are squarely within the learning zone. Mm -hmm. That means that they're stretched beyond comfort because we think that when students are a little uncomfortable in the classroom, that's where learning happens, that's where growth happens. Mm -hmm. However, we will come alongside and equip students with the correct instruction, resources, guidance, teaching, in order to be successful, even though they're in the learning zone and a little bit uncomfortable. So all I mean by that is that we want teachers who are pushing students, mm -hmm. pushing students to learn and grow. And we know every student's entering into school in a different spot mm -hmm. and uh, with different capabilities, and so one of the things we use is what we call a placement test. Uh, it's not an admissions test. It's not determining <laughs> whether or not they can afterward. come to Wheaton Academy because quite frankly, we have learners of all abilities here. We have some really high flying students who are capable of scoring perfectly on the ACT uh, to students who are uh, or have some learning needs and challenges uh, and to cite an example there of even a score by comparison, mm -hmm. uh, might score in the 16 to 18 range on the ACT. Mm -hmm. And the bottom line is there is room for all learners mm -hmm. here. And we want all learners here. Mm -hmm. And so the placement test helps us determine what classes will be the best fit for the student at that time, where they will be most successful. Mm -hmm. We take a look at uh, some math scores from the placement test, English scores from the placement test, and we'll place them in their classes accordingly and kind of use those scores to build the rest of their schedule around. Mm -hmm. And some are concerned that when they enter in, that placement score sticks with them for four years. And quite sure. frankly, that's not true. If mm -hmm. students are demonstrating ability or capability in a class where they might be misplaced, uh, we have the flexibility to make changes to a schedule pretty quickly if needed. Again, because we're trying to get students in the learning zone mm -hmm. and to place them where they're going to be most successful in class. Mm. Is that reevaluated each year or is a student kind of in that kind of trajectory for all four years? Talk to me a little bit about how that's um, how that may change. Sure, yeah, that, those evaluations are taking place pretty frequently, mainly on a yearly basis. However, there are cases where we'll reevaluate at the end of a semester and even make some changes at the end of a semester. That's great. So we'll use the learning zone to help um, place students in our kind of regular college readiness uh, classes, our advanced classes, which some you know, might call honors. Also AP is sometimes an option uh, within the same discipline. Is, is a student just on one track, like they're just in the regular track or the AP track or the advanced track, or can it kind of 
be different depending on the subject? Students are not tracked. It does depend on the subject and areas of passion and interest. Mm -hmm. And there are students who make changes uh, as they go through the years here. It really does depend on the student, on the class, and on the situation. But yeah, the whole track idea is not something that happens here. Mm -hmm. um, to get a sense, a firmer sense of progression through curriculum, uh, that's part of the high school roadmap. Um, where we can see sample snapshots of departments. And it's even worth looking at some of the images. I think we can call one of those up of what our math progression looks like mm -hmm. uh, to start off with some core skills in algebra. Um, and we even determine where a student was in eighth grade or in school prior to coming to Wheaton Academy uh, to best determine the fit for, for a math class. And then the progression kind of grows outward from there in those kind of concentric circles. One feature I'd love for you to highlight just briefly is Summer Academy and why that's such a unique feature to our school. That's a three week program in June, starting early June, usually finishing uh, before the 4th of July holiday. Mm -hmm. Uh, where students are in half-day classes or full-day classes mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, learning and growing and still getting what you would get from all the same content from a semester-long class, just condensing it uh, more acutely um, for, the, for the summer. Summer Academy affords students the ability to build in further flexibility into their schedule throughout the year. Uh, so Summer Academy is great for students who want to knock out some of their graduation requirements mm -hmm and create more space for electives. So for instance, we might have a student who's really musically talented, involved with the orchestra or the band or multiple of our fine arts programs, mm -hmm. and finds that if they weren't in Summer Academy, their schedule would be too cluttered by graduation requirements to fit some of these classes that are more areas of interest for them. Mm -hmm. uh, so that particular person might jump into a Summer Academy class, take communications or health over the mm -hmm. summer, uh, to check off some of these graduation requirements in order to more fully engage with all of the opportunities that our curriculum affords. I love that it's totally optional, but almost half of our student body participates <laughs> in it because it's just such a way for them to continue to customize their learning experience. Well, Brad, I want to thank you for your time and giving us a little highlight of our curriculum options and um, unique offerings that we have at the Academy. To wrap us up, is there any advice or just kind of final words you'd love to give our future families? If you have an area that you know that you're interested in, my advice would be to explore all the different possibilities our curriculum has to offer. So if you know you're passionate about the medical field, see what classes that we have that can meet that passion. And if you're someone who has no idea what you want to go on to study, that's fine. I didn't know what I wanted to study until I got to college. Uh, just know that um, what we're passionate about doing here is helping you discover your own giftings and areas of interest and no matter what classes you take I, I really think that our curriculum and what we have to offer here will help you uh, discover some of those gifts and passions. Thank you Brad. I know that was a lot of information to take in but we'd like to make some of the resources available to you that Brad mentioned. The curriculum guide, the high school road map, some other things and the links provided but also our website is a great resource for you to click around and learn a little bit more about the academic opportunities that your students have here at our school. Now I want to spend a little bit of time transitioning and introduce you to the teachers. The thing that Brad very much said is the core of our curriculum and I couldn't agree more. Um, the people who help make uh, learning come alive for our students and create a safe place for them to explore their passions but ultimately grow as followers of Jesus Christ. So I want to introduce you to three teachers today and hear a little bit of their perspective. But first, I'd like to show you a video that we call the I Believe video, where we interviewed a number of our faculty and staff and asked them to share a quick one sentence statement about what they believe about their experience as a Weed Academy teacher. So before you meet these individual teachers, let's watch this video. My name is Sean McCallum and I teach art at Wheaton Academy. My name is Valerie Gregerson. I teach pre-calculus. My name is Kieran Mack. My name is Helen Westerfield. I'm Jessica Hands. Brad Musso. Matt Hockett. Charity Moon. Tate Fritz and I teach Bible here at Wheaton Academy. Soy maestro de español aquí en Wheaton Academy. I teach math here at Wheaton Academy. I teach English here at Wheaton Academy. 
I believe we can learn about God through studying what he has made. I believe that Christianity transforms the way that even mathematics is taught and understood. I believe in the resurrection of the body and the fact that we see that in biology. I believe that God is at work in and through the lives of our students at Wheaton Academy. He's actively moving. He's for us, not against us. We can meet Jesus Christ through things that are true, good, and beautiful in literature. And so to open the Word of God with students daily is a great privilege. I believe each student has been given gifts. I believe that all people are artists. I believe every student has a story to tell, and God will use those stories to reveal himself to the world. I believe everyone can sing. Making music with other people creates a special relationship. Relationship with Him and with each other. God teaches us about Himself through people who are different than ourselves. We are better when we work together, even when we're very different. Yo creo que Dios ama a su diversidad y que creo que esa diversidad aquí está en Wheaton Academy. I believe that every student has innovative ideas and will be given opportunities to exercise their gifts, to grow in their skills, and to be successful. C'est pour la gloire de Christ. I believe every person is created in God's image and no one, no one is ever a mistake. And I believe that God blesses us when we humbly learn and love each other. Here at Wheaton Academy, I believe that we provide opportunities for relationships. Every student can actually be like Jesus and learn to love like Jesus. Redemption happens when students who have the mind of Christ rush to the world's hardest and most difficult problems. Well, my name is Robert Johnson, and I'm a parent here at Wheaton Academy. I have a daughter who's a junior, and I'm just really excited to have an opportunity to talk with some of our faculty members and ask them some questions that were on our minds as we chose Wheaton Academy for our daughter. But they're also fre frequently asked questions that come up from other parents. It's great to have uh, these three faculty members with me today, and I just want them to take a moment and introduce themselves. Hi, I'm Trish May. I'm head of the World Language Department, co-head of the English Department. I teach English, and I also teach Bible. Uh, my name is Nate Weeman. Uh, I am the head of the Social Studies Department, and I teach government, art history, world history, and economics. Hi, I'm Luke Regan, Science Department Head and Director of the Master Program here at Wheaton Academy. I primarily teach research, statistics, and the intersection of science and theology. So guys, just to dive right in, um, one thing that we knew was that Wheaton Academy maintains high academic standards, but at the same time, we were seeing how they would work with students to help meet those standards. Could, could you explain a little bit of what that looks like in a classroom, and, and even how do you see that play out in other students' lives? The main philosophy that, especially in the English department, is that we try to start with students where they are. We try to determine what, what places they are in their own personal growth, in their own personal learning, and then try to go from there to build them as far as they can go, as far as they, um, we can use our time to get them as far as they can go while we have them here at Wheaton Academy. So I guess the, the main thing I would say, that's a, the philosophical base. Beyond that, the practicalities practicalities would be that we give assignments that obviously can have not necessarily just one level of engagement, a writing prompt, for example. They might enter that writing prompt at a very basic level, and we start with them there and then build their skills from there. Or they might start it at a very analytical level and then we likewise do the same thing for them there. Um, whether we're talking about reading, writing, uh, even our grammar and vocabulary instruction, we try to start them at a, at a level where they can have some success, but yet will be challenged, and then take them from there. Every student will not graduate from Wheaton Academy at the same level, but they will, our, our goal is that they will progress uh, through the time here. We have a lot of support places that they can go to, whether it's individually with us or to our tutoring center or um, just trying to give them an idea of maybe what their strengths and their weaknesses are so that they can know where to focus their attention. I would agree with Trish in that 
uh, we all, all, all three of our departments represented and others try to meet students where they're at. And part of that, another thing is that we have over the last five or so years developed a uh, curriculum that is more elective based. And even some electives that meet multiple requirements, I could take a class that might allow me to earn English or science or uh, something of that matter. And some of our classes that we have created, I can speak to the social studies department, are all based on skills. It's not, can you memorize a certain thing that happened a long time ago and is supposedly very important to your life right now? There is very little of that and much more. Here is a primary source. Now, what skills do you have that are connected to uh, analysis, as Trish had mentioned? Or what skills do you have how does this document corroborate with another document, another source, whether it's a primary or secondary? Those kinds of skills are the building blocks that students get reinforced from day one of freshman year until the day they walk across the stage as seniors. And they're also, this allows them to also be very transferable from one discipline to the other. So not only do they have options because of electives, they have skills that help them, if I get this better in Mr. Lehman's history class, then maybe when I go to Mr. Regan's science class, I have another way, another sharper level of thinking to add to the sharpness that he's going to give me, and then I'm better in both classes. So that is also one of our goals, and that doesn't matter where students are in terms of day one skill level or day 1,000 skill level. Those things continue all the way through. I mean, high standards in part is, you know, when you do everything for the glory of God, which is something that we aim to do, that the standards are high in and of themselves. Um, and in science, it's one of those beautiful things, one of the best descriptions of science I've heard, it's an old one, is, is thinking of God's thoughts after him. And I think that applies to other areas too. And so we find that students have these questions just already at any level. I mean, even my, my kids who aren't students yet, my one-year-old is asking questions about a thing that God has made. Um, and that can be a simple question with a simple method, and we start there. And then our hope is you will see more of who God is when you learn to ask better questions and when you learn to listen better. And at any point, what God made is still what he made. I mean, it's, it's a beautiful, deep, complex, yet it's immediate. Um, and so there's, there's richness at that level. But then we get to walk with students to a point of, hey, just it goes this deep. Do you see that? and deeper. <laughs> and, and then we send them off. So um, that, that's an intimate process because you're talking to your creator. And so it's, it's relational to everyone, but it's also incredibly high standards because God has made something that we can only understand with his help. And so it's, it's the journey through that, that we get to see them from, from freshman year till senior year. Well, I feel like a, a good segue from, from what each of you are, are kind of talking about is um, one thing that we were concerned is how will our daughter be known as an individual and not just lumped into a class at large. And um, I know that Wheaton Academy values that we can see that, but just, just, could you guys speak a little bit to that? Like, why is it important? Why does it matter that Wheaton Academy sees each student as an individual that, um, and that, that you treat them there and you, and you walk them through their journey, like you said, um, Mr. Regan with, with each of those students. Can you talk to that a little bit? Yeah, it seems almost like all of it to me. <laughs> it's like, why are important things important? It almost seems like you asked me that question. Um, <laughs> e everyone is just so perfectly made. Uh, I mean, it, it's their ends in and of themselves. We're ends in and of ourselves. Um, and God places people in our lives to work with I think much more than he places ideas in our life to process. Um, and so being in a place where you can listen, uh, you can hear what a student says, ask a question and listen to the response. What do you think? Why do you think that? You start to get at, there's a rich history. There are people that have poured into this person's life for years. Um, <clears throat> so much has gone into getting this person to being a 14 year old. Um, and it's, it's all right there and it's all important. And, uh, to ignore that is to treat people, I think, as less than people. Um, and, and so it's, it's a long process. It's a slow process. But I think all of us have stories. We could, you know, just list off the names of students who we have 
seen as people early on and who have grown as people and who have set their sights on things beyond us. And I mean, this resonates with parents, right? We, we partner in that process. We get to see what parents have done and, and be a part of that. So uh, it, it's essential to who we are. One of the other things uh, I will just tie back into my other comment is that you get elective classes. And so that election on the student and the family's part helps us teachers know, oh, this kid picked this as opposed to that. And that in and of itself is a thing. I frequently have students two or three or four times by the time they graduate. And then when you tie in other co-curricular opportunities um, that we have in terms of everyday clubs or even things like Winterham where we have travel options, those things mean that when graduation happens, it's not just a ceremony where some people in robes walk from one side to the other. Graduation is a launch. We have built families, teachers, the school. We have built these um, human rockets, and they're going to launch, and they're going to go places, and they're going to do things. And then frequently, although not every day, and when it happens, it's really great, you get a little note back. You get a text message. You get an email like, hey, Mrs. Main, I'm doing this thing because you showed me I could and how to do it. And I couldn't do that at university, do it, whatever it is, unless I had spent time blah, blah, blah. So those stories uh, help us know that the process, graduation day, all fit together. And they're some of my favorite things when I get to see a student on the other side and they're this young adult person that is making these decisions based on the ethics that they got out of Mr. Regan's science class. I'm like, holy smokes, look at you go. You're doing something that I don't deal with and it's big and it matters and you are doing it because, in part, we spent a little time together and, you know, our proverbial elbows rubbed. And so you're, you've grown. Uh, and you've grown in, as Luke said, who God made you to be. And that's a cool process to see front to back. One of the things that I, as you guys were talking is that we have, we have curriculum, we have goals, we have objectives, we have all those good educational terminology things that we're supposed to have. But the reality is we don't expect those students to fit into that curriculum and into those goals, into those objectives. We expect God to use those things through us. We are called sometimes living curriculum teachers. Through us then to shape those students into who God has made them to be. And that to me is a, a big difference. We're not trying to form them by the curriculum, but we're actually wanting God to use us to build who he has created. We even as faculty are um, treated well and encouraged to grow and nudged in areas that we show potential. And um, the, the administration refers to that as living curriculum. And so part of what happens from teacher to student is a reflection of what the administration and the board reflects to us as the teachers. So there's this process that is not simply this inorganic, like I'm gonna like put these round pegs in the square holes of a student's life. It is this flow that you enter into and we all move down river and the students then jump into another river and they go do other amazing things. So how does Wheaton Academy teach 21st century skills? Communications, critical thinking, uh, cultural awareness, that type of stuff. How does Wheaton Academy incorporate that and into the classroom. One of the ways that we teach 21st century skills is not just, here's the book, memorize it, tell me. Um, a lot of what we do in social studies classes is problem-based learning or case studies. Um, and those get more complex as students go up. The use of primary sources um, increases the expectation to be able to nuance the differences between this type of primary source versus that type of primary source. Um, and if you tie that into uh, some of the electives that we have, if I'm more curious about this kind of thing, then I can build my skill there. But if I take a different kind of class, guess what? I'm still going to get better at analysis. I'm still going to get better at my written communication. It's just going to show up in a different way. 
I would affirm everything that he was saying about reading, writing, thinking, evaluating. That's, that's our core in English. We want to um, make certain that what we choose for the students to read will open their um, minds, obviously, to other uh, understandings, other cultures, other, other experiences that they have not had that would help them to understand other people better. And so that's, that's part of what we would add to that maybe through literature. Um, I'm also head of the World Language Department and in that not only are they learning a language, but learning to appreciate the culture of the people who speak the, the language as their first language. They're learning to appreciate the, the need for clarity in language so that good communication can, can, uh, can occur. So everything we do really is focused on being able to be a better thinker through reading, through writing, through evaluating, and then interacting even verbally communication. Our communication classes are designed to do the very same thing, how to collaborate well. So I would say that everything we do is helping students learn how to be better thinkers, better communicators, um, and also hopefully better at evaluating in their own life the decisions they're making. And for me, it's always being in conversation with the right types of things. So one of our very first introduction to research classes, our first lab is to make a specific type of crystal. And then not just to make it, but to find out the best way to make it. And so students are like, well, what should I do? And we get into this mantra of, I think you should ask nature that question. Because that's at the heart of what science is. I don't want you to be in relationships with facts via me. I want you to be in relationship I mean, with truth via the things God has created. And my job here is to help you do that. So they're like, hey, should I, should I add this? What if I add food coloring? And I'm like, that sounds like a good question for nature. They <laughs> finish the sentence for me. But they get a sense in that kind of that friendly back and forth that real learning uh, and the way learning ought to be and the way it can be when we have the tools that we have is you should be in conversation with more than facts. Um, you should be engaging with other communities. You should be get engaging with other worldviews. You should be engaging with nature. And here are the tools to do that. Oh, by the way, this is really hard. You're going to have to do it together. Here's how you're going to work together and how you're going to divvy that up. Here's how you're going to disagree with each other. Um, all of those tools are just is essential. And it's a main focus here. How do we put you in, in conversation with historical primary sources, with nature itself, with people in that culture, as opposed to the representations of those things, which has been pre-digested for you um, as a series of facts, you know, now, now recite them back. That context matters, but the movement is from that um, to the real conversations, because that's where I think all of us find most of the real learning happens. Wow, those are great answers. And I just want to say a quick thank you for taking this time to, to answer these questions as, as just kind of a representation of what other parents are thinking about right now as they're looking at Wheaton Academy. And, and I know things that we thought about, and, and I can't say it enough, but we are so thankful that, that we have faculty like you guys in our daughter's lives. So, so thank you guys for taking this time. I really do appreciate it. Thank you, Trish, Nate, and Luke for your time and your insight in what makes Wheaton Academy such a special place. And a special thanks to all of our participants today as we highlighted academics at Wheaton Academy. I hope you found it helpful and inspiring. I love working at this place because it's full of people like the ones you've met today. People who love the Lord, love students, and are really missioned to help students experience that Wheat Academy be full of growth, not only in their learning, but in their love for Christ. Thanks for joining us. I encourage your family to take the next step. On our website, on the admissions tab, there's a button of apply now, and I encourage you to start that application. They are open, and we're excited to get to know your family in the future through that process.